Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to another COVID debunking video. This week, I'm covering Dr. Mobin Saeed, otherwise known as Dr. Bean. Dr. Bean is a medical doctor who no longer practices medicine, but offers medical lectures online. Now, he has become quite popular over the last few months, especially among anti-vaccine crowds, and that's because his content caters to anti-vaxxers. And basically, that is the problem with him. So in this video, I'm going to be going over one of his medical lectures that he gave on COVID vaccines, specifically the spike protein in the blood following COVID vaccination, and explain why he is misleading, wrong, and downright anti-vaccine in some of his views. So let's get started. So for context here, Dr. Bean is discussing this paper in his video. In this paper, the authors used a very sensitive detection assay called a Samoa assay in order to detect S1 spike protein in the blood of patients after they were vaccinated. In short, the results were that there was detectable S1 antigen in the blood of patients following their first dose of COVID vaccination, but not following their second dose. This is explained by the fact that we have an immune response by the time we get our second dose that kicks in and clears up any S1 antigen in the blood before we can even detect it. Individuals who got the first shot of Moderna vaccine, they had spike protein, some of them, three of them, but all of them had S1 part of the spike protein in their plasma. That was not supposed to happen. The first thing that Dr. Bean is extremely misleading about this paper and throughout his entire video is this idea that this wasn't supposed to happen, that we weren't supposed to detect S1 antigen in the blood ever following vaccination. And this is simply not true. The authors themselves don't even comment on this finding being surprising. That's because they expected to find some antigen in the blood following vaccination. That's why they did these experiments in the first place. What was always said was that there was going to be a negligible or small amount of spike protein in the blood following vaccination. So small that we don't have to worry about it impacting our health. And that's what we see, as I'll get into later in this video. But the point for now is that these results were not surprising. The authors expected to find some small amount of S1 antigen in the blood, and then they expected that to be cleared by the immune response elicited after the second dose. And that is, again, what they saw and what they describe in their paper. So right away, Dr. Bean is making a very misleading and wrong claim. And it is this claim that goes on to fuel the rest of his anti-vaccine speculation throughout the rest of the video. There is an interesting part of the some uh, the study, and that is that I believe I believe that researchers stopped short of explaining the possible outcomes of finding these proteins in the plasma or presence of these pro proteins in the plasma. Nope, the authors don't stop short at all. The clinical implications of their findings are outside the scope of their paper. They just say that the clinical implications should be explored, and they leave it at that. And that's fine. We can explore the literature and see if others have answered this question as to the clinical relevance of the concentration of spike protein in the blood that they observe. And as we'll see, others have answered that question and found that that concentration is very safe. It doesn't associate with any adverse events. But Dr. Bean doesn't lead his viewers to believe that. He instead inserts his own speculation, which, as I'll explain, is totally baseless, in order to scare his viewers into thinking that this amount of spike in the blood is in fact harmful, which it's not. But the problem with Dr. Bean is that he's going to spend most of the rest of this video talking about three papers that he thinks shows that spike in the blood is dangerous. Let's see what he has to say, and then I'll go through exactly why he's wrong. This is another study talking about ACE2 spike protein and when spike protein binds with ACE2, the imbalance that creates for the inflammation and anti-inflammation, pro-inflammation and anti-inflammation system in our body. So this paper is talking about the very simple concept that ACE2 serves functions in the human body, functions that may be disrupted when it's binding a viral protein instead of what it's supposed to bind. 
and that situation could cause problems. But that's not all Dr. Bean is saying here. Remember, Dr. Bean is using this paper as evidence that spike in the blood is dangerous, specifically spike in the blood following vaccination. And making that conclusion from this paper is a huge leap. This paper does not support that. This paper talks about SARS-CoV-2 infection. Infection is very different from vaccination. When the virus is replicating in certain areas of your body, like your lungs, and disrupting ACE2 function there, then that's not going to be the same as when you get vaccinated and spike protein is produced mostly in your deltoid muscle and some seeps into the bloodstream. The two situations are not comparable. So let's slow down for a minute. Dr. Bean's hypothesis is that spike protein in the blood following vaccination is dangerous. How do we test that hypothesis to know whether or not it's correct? Well, a good experiment to try would be to take spike protein alone and inject that directly into the bloodstream of an animal and see what happens. Now, these are the kinds of experiments that Dr. Bean goes to next, but there are significant problems with them supporting his hypothesis. They actually reject his hypothesis. So let's see what he says. And then again, I'll explain why he's wrong. This is another study that talks about S1 protein, if present, can cross blood-brain barrier and what kind of an outcome that can cause. Okay, so in this paper, he's pointing out that the authors found that spike protein appears to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier in mice. Now, what the researchers actually did is pretty important here. They injected the spike protein intravenously, directly into a vein of a mouse, in order to see what happened. They also injected a lot of spike protein into the blood, more than what we would see in an infection or in vaccination. So does this say anything for humans? Well, no, this paper alone does not say anything for humans. It says that a high concentration of spike protein in mice can cross the blood brain barrier, but that doesn't support his hypothesis. Not surprisingly, it's a similar problem in the next paper he talks about. This is another study about the S1. We'll talk about this. This study says that S1 or spike in the plasma can cause hypercoagulability, and that may be important to understand why some people become hypercoagulable with SARS-CoV-2. So here's the title of the paper that he's talking about in this clip. What the researchers did here was they took blood and put it in a dish, and then put spike protein directly into it in order to see what would happen. And they did observe coagulation. In other words, blood clotting. But you really have to look at the concentration of spike protein that they added. They added spike protein at a concentration of one nanogram per milliliter. Now compare that concentration to what the researchers found in the main paper that we're talking about here, where they found 68 picograms per milliliter of S1 antigen in the blood following vaccination. For those of you who don't know, picograms are 1,000 times smaller than nanograms, which are 1,000 times smaller than micrograms, which are 1,000 times smaller than milligrams, and so on. Picograms is a very, very tiny amount, and it's much tinier than the concentration that they used in this paper that Dr. Bean is talking about. And the researchers were explicit in saying that that one nanogram per milliliter concentration was the needed concentration in order to see effects. So these results are not applicable to what we see in patients post-vaccination. It is totally irresponsible for Dr. Bean in this medical lecture to claim that that paper shows that vaccination is dangerous because it can cause blood clots. It's totally wrong. In fact, mRNA vaccination has not been associated with blood clotting at all. This is after billions of doses have been given and exhaustive surveillance studies have been done. There's just no evidence for it. And Dr. Bean is lying to his audience because I think he knows that that is the case. But being honest apparently isn't what gets him the views and pleases his audience. So he says stuff like this. When they say that, hey, we've gotten clarity after the antibodies are formed, it is also possible that actually there is no clarity, but there are antibodies which are quickly binding to this spike protein. So then your question could become that, well, we are good then, right? 
we have gotten the antigen and antibody connected with each other, it is essentially equal to spike getting cleared. Maybe. Maybe. But I would actually request you to read up on type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. Right, so he acknowledges the whole important finding of the study, which is that vaccines work. We see a very tiny amount of spike protein in the blood following the first dose because our bodies are not immunologically primed to react very quickly to it. And then after the second dose, we don't see the spike protein in the blood because our immune systems have reacted and cleared it. But to him, this still doesn't cut it. This still might mean that there are harmful effects happening. And he tells his audience to look up type 3 hypersensitivity. Well, let's do that, shall we? Because he doesn't really explain it much in this video. He just briefly claims that type 3 hypersensitivity can, in this case, happen when spike protein is bound by an antibody and then that complex is deposited onto tissue where it can cause damage. This situation specifically happens when antigen is in excess of the antibody. So when there are much more antigen present than antibody, that's when this situation can happen. But that's not what we see in this situation following COVID vaccination. Why? Because we know that there are lots of antibody present capable of clearing out that spike antigen, which is why we don't see it after that second dose. There is just no evidence that type 3 hypersensitivity is an issue with COVID vaccines. Dr. Bean just says maybe it's an issue and then uses a bunch of medical jargon to convince his audience that he's right, that it could be a real issue. And then they get scared and they believe him and they trust him and they like him and they keep coming back and watching his videos. All the while, becoming more and more emboldened in their anti-vaccine stance. His comments are full of anti-vaxxers thanking him for being a, quote, honest, good scientist who tells the truth. It's just so irresponsible, and Dr. Bean, I think, knows what he's doing here. So let's do some of the work that Dr. Bean should have done for this video for him. If Dr. Bean is right that this concentration of spike in the blood is harmful, and that if it's not cleared by antibody, then it could have some detrimental effects. Well, we have the resources to answer those questions. There are people who don't form a good antibody response to COVID vaccines. For example, it's well known that patients who have received kidney transplants are not going to make a good antibody response when they are vaccinated using the COVID vaccines. However, it has been consistently shown that COVID vaccines are just as safe for these patients as they are for anybody else. No increased rates of adverse events were observed in kidney transplant patients as opposed to a regular population. Again, these patients don't have a good antibody response. They can't clear the spike protein. So these kidney transplant patients are producing spike protein prompted by the vaccine. They are not able to produce a good antibody response to efficiently clear that spike protein. Some of it is getting into their blood, but the rate of adverse events in this population is no greater than adverse events in normal populations. That's because this concentration of spike protein in the blood following vaccination is not toxic. It is too small to have any toxic effects. The dose makes a poison. In almost every single situation, adverse events from vaccinations are caused by the individual's own immune response. And different individuals will have different immune responses. That's why it's complicated to answer why some individuals seem to have worse adverse events in response to vaccination than others. But it does not have to do with the spike protein in COVID vaccines. Dr. Bean is misleading, misguiding, and at times I think lying to his audience in order to get views. It's as simple as that. Of course, I only go over one video where Dr. Bean exhibits this behavior, but he does the same thing in several of his lectures, many of which have been directly sent to me by anti-vaxxers who say that he supports their views. So Dr. Bean, if you want to be popular among anti-vaxxers, then have fun making your money doing that. But if you want to be a scientist with integrity and 
convey accurate information to your listeners, you have to change. And this is the problem with Dr. Bean and others like him, such as John Campbell. These people use their title of doctor online to give the illusion that they're offering correct and valid information. It's often given in a way that appears sensible, a way that appears reasonable, but really when you dig into it, they're alluding to all of these anti-vaxxing tropes. They're supporting anti-vaxxers, emboldening them, and making them more sure in their decision to not get vaccinated, when that is the opposite of what an honest scientist, honest doctor would be doing in their medical lectures. So, Dr. Bean, you have a responsibility to offer accurate, correct information to your audience, not encourage conspiracy theories and blame the authors for when their writing doesn't support your hypotheses. And remember that Brigham and you and Women Hospital was involved in this because there is an author who may had have had a conflict of interest. Yeah, Dr. Bean, it's not a conflict of interest. It's not a conspiracy. Your ideas were not reflected in that paper because your ideas are not supported by the literature. Now, I know you have me blocked on Twitter, but I'm willing to talk to you privately or publicly if you so desire. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's video. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, all of the links to all of the papers that I talk about in this video are linked in the description below so that you can check them out for yourself. Thanks again for watching, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.